Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Kiri Leon TU podcast. Today we have we have with us Jason Mark Campeo. So please, Jason, introduce yourself the way you actually want to be introduced. Well, hi there. Thank you so much for having me on the show. If I was going to introduce myself, I would mostly just talk about maybe the, the manifesto that I want to bring into the world, maybe a bit of the reason as to why I do the things that I do. And for those who aren't aware, I host a podcast called the Selling with Love podcast, where I interview people and make them think about sales differently for particularly people that have ethical businesses and want to do sales, but always struggled with it, always looked at it as a yucky kind of activity to do. And I bring so many experts that perceive sales in a different way, give you ways to apply sales in ways you may never have considered that make you more effective in pushing your impact forward. And more excitingly is my book is coming out on February 15th, uh, 2022. And it is of the same title, Selling with Love, How to Earn with Integrity and Expand Your Impact. And so this has been a project I've been working on for the last two years. So very excited to bring this to the masses. And, you know, for most people that, you know, have been made aware of me, they've seen me do some work with Mind Valley, which is a personal growth publishing company or edutech company. I worked with them for seven years, worked on big projects such as Mind Valley University, a live event that runs for a whole month. I published a best selling book with the founder, Vishen Lakiani. I've worked with a lot of the top authors in the personal growth industry, bringing them onto the platform, finding better ways to partner with them. And really got involved in a lot of different departments from launching products at, you know, million dollar two week campaigns to, you know, the, running an entire department, which was actually on entrepreneurial product, online marketing products. So I've been in a couple of different things while I was there. And if I want to go even before that, I used to be in real estate. I would raise private funds and invest in real estate in America as a Canadian. So uh, Kia gives you a lot of different ways you can take this. I'll let you pick which one finds yourself being more interested in mm -hmm. and hopefully I can give something that the audience can can apply. Yeah, so I think we should focus more on the on how you got started with Man Valley, how you got started with like your podcast, how you got started with your book, how you become how basically how you started with this stuff. Sure. Well, I think the easiest place to start is just I found myself in an opportunity to travel to Malaysia. I was living in uh, Thailand. And what happened is I'd read a book that I, I feel like your listeners might be aware of called the four hour work week. Mm. And this uh, is a funny mind thing. blowing. I had it somewhere here. You I had read it there? It. <laughs> I read it. I read it like four years ago or something. That's right. So I, I picked that up probably, well, I'm going to date myself, but probably 10 years ago. And what happened is I started rejecting the traditional nine to five model. And I had this interesting idea. I was being really well paid. I was managing investment funds for this real estate company, raising private equity to invest in multi-unit properties. And I had this idea where I went to my boss and I said, Hey, I want to renegotiate my salary. And he's like, well, you're already the highest paid employee here. So what more do you want? <laughs> I was like, well, I agree with you. And I think we should fix that. I think you should pay me half. And he's like, okay, tell me more. And so long story short, this was back in 2012. And I was able to negotiate a work from home contract. And because I went to university for a semester abroad in Thailand, I had so many friends there. So I decided to relocate there, knowing that the cost of living was one third. So I would be ahead of the game, having more flexibility, more freedom, and a lifestyle design that was really Ooh. great. So in there, there was a bit of the challenging of the, you know, the traditional path of following that career. So I found myself down there and Malaysia is not that far away and Mind Valley had a blog that I followed that were teaching online marketing practices. I was a big fan, super fanboy. And one of the emails they sent out said, you can come visit their office. And so I didn't let that opportunity pass. It was just two hour flight away. So I went into their office and you know, it was at a time that I had a high level of skepticism about people who market online. I, I felt like a lot of them, you know, promised more than what they actually were. And when I walked through the doors of Mind Valley, and I was like, wow, they had a great office, amazing people doing real work and building something incredible on a mission that I thought was great. And I was like, why wouldn't I be here? And so right then and there, I applied and long story short, spent seven years working with them from that moment. So, so from the moment that you got into the office and you decided to re renegotiate your salary, because for most of us, like, I don't know if you saw my face, but I, I was like, what the frick? Why would you negotiate for half of your salary? I'm like, what the frick? Because most people expect like, ah, ask for more or something. I'm like, okay, this is where he's going to go. But then you tell me like, ask for half. I'm like, why would he ever want to do that? So how mm. did you ever get the idea of like, 
asking for less who gave you the courage was it just like out of your mind or like did you read something no well the four hour work week does make a reference to this that it's not just about becoming an entrepreneur you can renegotiate your work arrangements to design the lifestyle you want around that and for me it was more of a question of understanding you know I, as as an employee working for a company your boss is basically the buyer you're the seller as an employee and so when i'm meeting with my buyer negotiating for repeat business which is an extension of contract an amendment to contract for your work <laughs> employment it is a sale well i started thinking what do i understand about the buyer what do i know about the buyer well they're always looking to reduce costs they want to get as much done for the lowest cost so if i know that what will get the most attention from my buyer is the reduced cost then what can i liberate from my obligations if i can give them what they want so that's why if I come into the office for a serious negotiation, capture attention with something that they weren't expecting, which is, I want you to pay me less then every other demand that I had with that was being received and were accepted. And at the end of the day, to be honest, I didn't get paid half. We, it just opened the conversation to restructure the contract. But that was just the, let's sit down because here are things that I want, which included relocation, working from home and working on things that I could do remotely, including doing more coaching, doing more support of the clients. So I completely redesigned my work arrangement, but the moment that I stepped in the office and proposed that, we knew that we were gonna be here to discuss something that had never been done before. And then that designed a great lifestyle for me. Yeah, that's great. So so your boss accepted, you moved to Thailand, you said? And, Thailand, yes, right. And then explain more how you got in contact with like Mind Valley because you were a fanboy and they were present and you got a two hour flight. <laughs> Where next? What happened next? So I, I was in Thailand and I was living there, but there was something I, I felt like I was just, I was making a lot of money. Like at this point I'm making a six figure salary. Uh, I'm 23 or 24 years old at this time in Thailand, still making really good money at a young age. And I was like, what's the point? You know, like what, what from here, is there more, am I, and you know, being in my twenties in Thailand, life was good, you know, and I was meeting with some friends, but then I was like, what if I want to make a bigger impact? Like there's a part of me that yearns to do more. And so when I visited Mind Valley and I got to understand the mission that they were standing for, I just flew out and saw their headquarters. And I was like, wow, I don't know, you know, I don't know where I fit into this ecosystem, but it's a bus that's going to places that I really like. It's making an impact that I resonate mm -hmm. with sign me up. And you know, now I want it. And it's, it's so interesting because when I got into mind Valley, the initial offer that they made for me was again, a, a question of reduction of salary. It was a third of my existing salary, but I accepted the offer because if I could do a work that would give me such relevant experience that would work with the values that I wanted to do and make the impact that I was aligned with my own. then I was like, Hey, this is going to be incredible. And side note, I knew I wasn't going to stay at that salary for very long. <laughs> I mean, I'm willing to accept a low salary because I'm going to show up there and provide such massive value that I'll be back to renegotiate once it's been proven. Mm -hmm. Great. So what did you, what, what exactly did you do at Mind Valley, and how did you decide to start your own podcast and then decide to start your own book and everything? Yeah. Yeah. So I got into Mind Valley. I worked on the product launch team. I ran the entrepreneurship division, worked on the PR for the launch of the book, ran the events team. So I played a lot of different positions, including being on the executive team while I was there. But the podcast actually was an emergence from a lot of the work that I had already been doing. Vision, which was the founder, really liked the way that I communicated with authors. And so I was given the opportunity to interview some of them in a studio. And then people started watching the interview saying, wow, you're, like, you're, you're quite good at doing these interviews. And he could tell that I was starting to, I don't know if it's called get bored, but I wasn't maximizing my own talent within the organization. So that we were trying to find a role that I could stay with Mind Valley and it would still fulfill some of the needs that I had because I'm quite entrepreneurial in nature. And so the idea was proposed that, hey, we're going to create a podcast. You're going to be supported by Mind Valley. It's going to be called Superhumans at Work. And because you've proven yourself throughout the years with how you show up in every single day, in every single assignment, you're going to get a chance to interview people and we'll see how it goes. And I was able to run this podcast alongside Mind Valley for two years. And what's fascinating is I always maintain a really great relationship. Even as I left Mind Valley back in 2020, I left Mind Valley and they still kept publishing the podcast for an extra year. And then when we came back to the negotiating table, which was in the summer of 2021, 
I was speaking with the founder and they were like, Hey, podcasting isn't a place we can dedicate the resources we want to do. And so we're trying to look at different options. And I said, well, I'd love to inherit my podcast. And so from the end of 2021, Mind Valley gave me all the assets to the podcast. It's been renamed the Selling with Love podcast, and now I get to run it fully autonomously. And I still have a great relationship with a past employer. I still have so many connections I'm so grateful for. And I think this is, this is something that a lot of people might miss from going straight into the entrepreneurial journey. Is I do believe that when you get into a career that aligns with your values, it gives you such an advantage for when you get into your entrepreneurial path. Like the things I've learned, the scale that I was able to do things, the teams I was able to work with has been so invaluable to put me in the place that I am now. And I think a lot of people spit on the possibility of working the nine to five with a company. But if you're working on relevant projects, this is going to be where you sharpen your skills and get to have an accelerated learning experience. So for me, I'm so grateful to all the experience I had there. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I agree with you, like the experience and how much you learned in a specific, like, like maybe it's a side hustle that you do, like a job with Mind Valley or anything, a, a project that you that you're on that maybe you're not making um, enough, like you're not making the salary or making the money that you you wanted to make. It's like still powerful because four months ago, the beginning of October 2021, I started my own business. So it. And it started out of nowhere. And like as a 19 year old, how am I supposed to have like previous experience with like starting my own business? I had no one to mentor me. And even, even if people mentored me, like every business and every situation has its, has its own context. So you never like their advice might not even apply. Although like their advice could be true in their own context. The context is so like different because like, it's just not the same. It's just the client's mm. brains are so different that you cannot apply that advice from their situation, although it might be helpful for some terms. So I think the learning experience has been amazing and is amazing for people that, so like if people are looking to get into a new job that may not pay the salary that they want, but they will get to work with really amazing people, then it would lead to a bigger salary over the, over the next few years that they might have like other opportunities from it. You also have to take into consideration that everybody has a different risk profile. And I had a chance to interview a wonderful individual. His name is Kaihan Krippendorf. And he wrote the uh, book, The Rise of the Intrapreneur. And this is people with entrepreneurial qualities, but that prefer to work within an organization. And here's one of the biggest things that differentiates an intrapreneur and an entrepreneur based on his uh, work was the fact that an entrepreneur can take big risks. Their, their tolerance to risk is insatiable. They'll just go all in and do it. If it fails, doesn't matter. Pick yourself up, do it again. And that's a strong character and takes a lot of courage. But you know, for some people, and I'll put myself in this category, and I don't consider this a bad thing, is we're much more calculated with the risks that we take. And you know, that might not yield you the home run, but you're gonna get some doubles and triples very often. And when you're actually working within a company, you get to take big risks, make more impact. And in his research, he said that some of the greatest inventions that we get to benefit from today wasn't developed by entrepreneurs. They were actually developed by intrapreneurs within an organization that had the resources, had the network, had marketing PR and reach. And that, mm. you know, the process of go to market could be done within this existing supply chain. And so you get huge advantages, lower risk, and it becomes a learning opportunity. So if your audience is kind of deciding like, what do I want to do? I would not close the door on any entrepreneurial venture. If you have that huge appetite for risk, I know it will make you grow fast, but you're going to feel lost. Sometimes you're going to need to seek mentorship and you're going to be extremely responsible for everything. But if you want to continue a bit more of that mentorship, you want to be groomed, then there's nothing wrong with seeking an organization that you align with its values. And that gives you that path that you can grow extremely quick and in a very calculated way. Yeah, I agree. And I think some people, maybe they hate the idea that some, someone else is profiting, profiting from them and they want to get like all that money because they say, oh, I get paid like $10 an hour, let's say, and my, my boss is like really rich, but do you want to take that risk? No, I don't. Then stay there because he's taking the risk and he's spending his own money. All that you're doing is like spending your, your time and like, if you want to spend mm. your own money and take your own risk and maybe fail them, sure. But he's paying you no matter what happens. Like, even if it fails, succeeds, he's still paying you. So, I mean, it's all, it's all about options. And 
Yeah. Okay, so you started, so in 2021, you got your own podcast back from Mind Valley. And um, by the way, I really think it's really smart that you, well, I th- I, I'm not sure if you're doing this still, but you're going live with your podcast guests. I remember like a few few months ago, maybe even a year ago, that you were going live with your guests. I'm not sure if you were still if you're still doing that, but that was really smart because of two reasons. You get like real, okay, not on Instagram. It's a bit there has some delay, but you get, you get like feedback and questions and insights from the audience, and it's so cool. And I think like his audience comes in, so they get to know each other, and you get insights from their audience what they what they want you to ask your guests. So I feel like it was really powerful that you do that. Yeah. Yeah. The Instagram live is something I've done uh, close to a hundred episodes on my Instagram live. I do admit I have put it on hold because it was a giant research project because all of the mechanics seem to make sense. And I encourage everybody, if you're trying some strategy, like this is from Noah Kagan. So I interviewed this man, AppSumo, great, great man. And he, he does always doing crazy stuff. And he said, try something a hundred times before making the decision if it's worth your time. And this is what I did with Instagram lives. And there were sometimes it was successful. Sometimes it was just, you know, barely anybody would tune in. So it was a fun experiment, but I've decided to work on more high leverage types of interviews. I did actually find that it didn't bring the reach that I would expect from the cross pollination of the audiences. I wasn't seeing anybody doing this. And I was like, it would make sense. I did it. I did it. And in my case, I didn't feel like it actually had the best growth strategy that it could. And that's just the data that I seen. Now, mind you, I have, I have a podcast that I do two interviews and I release. So now it's more on YouTube and it's on the podcast and I can create reels that are being highly promoted on Instagram. And so I have one medium that I can create all sorts of different assets for all the different types of platforms. Right? So I'm always trying to think of how to be more efficient. What I didn't like about the Instagram lives is if I do an interview there, well, it's visibility isn't that far once it's recorded and the amount of people that get to tune in live. Well, I still didn't capture their email and then people show up at random times. They don't necessarily plan for it. Although I have seen that they've released a scheduling tool for your Instagram lives. Mm. Haven't tested that feature yet, but given that I'm all hands on deck for a book launch, now it's not as much about me bringing guests every time I have an extra second is making myself available to go and share my message on other people's platforms. So the game has been a lot of PR has been a lot of media. And that's been a really fun thing to do. Very scary at the same time. Because I'm used to working with a company and now it's putting myself out there. So insecurities, you know, and the Mm. whole concept of self-love and, you know, not being a hundred percent certain before taking action, but taking action anyways, those come into play and they're not insignificant. It's, it's reality. It's part of the human experience and it's fascinating to witness. Yeah. Agreed. And I think the, I think publishing your own book without any help is is way harder than people think because it's not just failing. It's like failing and not blaming anyone but yourself with, with like help from other people. If you fail, then you can blame them. You can blame that company, you can <laughs> show fingers. But if you do it all on yourself, like be, be different from the rest, first of all, you're going to get criticism. And second of all, if you fail, then you're going to get more criticism. For like, t- because they were gonna tell you like, why don't you go with them? You should have gone with them. Everyone does this is for a reason. Why don't you follow the masses? Do you think you're different? Do you think you're better? And like, this is way riskier than. Th- this is way harder, and it puts way more pressure on yourself than people realize. Because most people do not do this stuff. So, so like, people like you are the ex- exception. Of course, it's growing, but I think very small majority of people are different, and it's way more pressure. I would provide maybe a piece of advice if, if your audience is willing to consider, which is something I've brought more and more into my own life. I do a lot of goal setting methodologies. And one of them is uh, defining my life into 12 different categories using a process called life book. And one of those categories is character. And here would be my, my call it my tip, my advice, maybe something to think about is that you have a choice of taking that ridiculous, crazy amount of self-responsibility in every situation. And what I've tried to do as much as possible, even if I'm working in a company, even if I'm in a relationship that might not be going the way that I want in a personal matter, maybe it's, you know, anything that's happening in both my professional and personal life, I've always asked myself the question, how am I responsible for this? How am I responsible for this? 
And I think when you start living your life, taking this radical responsibility for every event that's happening around you, it actually starts making you grow. It actually starts making you have a shaped character that makes you more resilient and you start achieving great things and experiencing a lot less suffering because you feel more in control and you are. Yeah, exactly. But I agree with that. But I think we should, we should also mention that take as much this sounds like a no-brainer, but I feel like a lot of people are into this problem. Take as much responsibility as you can take. Like, don't take too much. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Because I fall, I fell into this trap, I don't know if I'm alone, that I'm like, okay, like, um, I do this stuff, but I can do more. Like, from this old, from this old motivation, because there's no like no one says like this exact specific limit of like how much you should push how much you should push yourself and like this is why i stop hearing a lot from other people's advice and this is why i hate generic advice i think like people should give a lot more specific advice based on the context how they come to that realization to give that advice because there is so many different contexts that people can take it if you just provide over generalized advice so yeah people should put pressure on themselves as much as they can take yeah i would agree to that i and you know i i stand slightly corrected because you're right listen from a different perspective it could lead to burnout it could lead to overwork but you know i would still suggest for people to take an inventory around your life and if not getting enough rest being overworked i still think it's our responsibility to set the boundaries and mm -hmm. so if you can take more responsibility, you have to design your life so that it supports you, it doesn't kill you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think like comparing ourselves with, with other people, it's harmful because in, if you look at scientific data, they compare two things that are, that, that are the same or really similar, but you cannot really compare two different people because there's so many different things that happen to them. Like even your thoughts are not even close, similar to them. So how can you compare yourself with other people that, that grew up in a different way, that think different than you, that they are completely different than you? So I think you should first like, of course, meditation helps or like going for a walk and just thinking with yourself, like thinking what you do. So do like self-reflection stuff and stop completely blindly listening to other people's advice of course you should take it into consideration and you should test it out yourself but always use your own rational thinking or i think i should go with rational thinking green so yeah i think we should go more into your journey with the book how you got started what was the idea what what is, what is that book about and everything it's selling with love but we would love to learn more about it yeah so what happened is the story is the fact that we had somebody coming to do a public speaking training at my valley and they asked us to prepare a short talk three to five minutes and this idea i was always known as the sales guy you know everyone knew jason was always selling he loved selling i'd have such an enthusiasm when it came to selling that it was considered odd most people would hesitate or, or balk at selling versus me. I had this, this, this glow every time I'd get into a sales scenario. And every time we'd be in meetings, I'd think about ways we can sell more and how we can make this beautiful. And then people were like, wow, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and then I started, you know, while I was preparing that talk that I wanted to deliver, I said like, well, I love selling, but how can you sell with love? It just came to me as an idea. Right. Hmm. And it's very interesting because I think some of these best ideas get channeled to certain individuals. And then it's going to be your decision to see if you want to take action on it or just say like, oh, interesting thought. But the series of circumstances made it so that I had to do a talk. This thought came through. And so I decided to give a stab at, you know, presenting this idea. And it was so well received. People were like, this is great. And then there was an event and it was 500 people in uh, Croatia, Dubrovnik. And the most prestigious event that Mind Valley runs called A-Fest. And I went to the, I was just the AV guy. When I went to these events, I was taking care of the speakers audio setup, and I was just a volunteer there working at mind Valley, but I still went to the organizers and I said, I want to get on stage. I have a message to share. And they're like, who are you? You know, you're not. <laughs> and I was like, I guarantee if you put me on stage, I'm going to deliver a talk that is going to be incredible. And the long story short is the fact that a speaker canceled. I went to them. I said, I'm ready. My slides are done. You can put me on stage. I'll take the slot. They pick someone else. 
that person got stopped at the border. It didn't have the proper visa. So a second cancellation happened. And I said, the universe is waiting for you to just say yes to me. And I'm going to make sure that everything's okay. And it became voted the best talk at that event. And so, so sick. I was onto something. I kept talking about it. It was my ethos, but didn't really, you know, it was there. And I had set a goal back in 2013 that I wanted to write a book. I didn't know it was going to be a book about this. But I was starting to be the selling with love guy. And then I did that talk in a couple of places. I tested that concept on a different few podcasts and it was always being well received. And I was like, this is a message I want to share with the world. And so as I started looking at how I want to develop my own personal brand, my own business and stepping away from just being within Mind Valley, but how do I build my personal brand outside of it too? I realized selling with love is the thing I want to do. And it was through a chance encounter with a friend who's just sharing with me, Colton, I'm very grateful to him. He's like, if there's any message you want to put, you know, put your stick in the ground, your flag about what you stand for, there's one thing. The one thing you can do is write a book because a book is what stands the test of time, allows you to develop your idea. And then it's your business card about what you stand for. You're the author of selling with love. And I was like, this makes sense. And so then I seeked mentorship and guidance. And I was working already with an organization that was sending me people to interview on my podcast that helped them publish their books. So I got in touch with them and they did assisted self-publishing. So I went through their program, paid a lot of money for them to guide me, which most of the guidance I needed was what they call fear solving instead of, sorry, fear setting instead of goal setting, it was fear setting. And through the workshop, they made us go, and this was scribe scribe is a fantastic organization. What they did is they actually made you list all the fears you would have about writing a book. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm, I haven't developed this idea enough. I don't know if I'll write a book. Will people laugh? Like anything that came into mind, you come up with like five, 10 ideas, and then you start realizing what's the worst that could happen. What could you do to prevent that? And you realize, hey, there are tools that I can use and solutions to every perceived problem here. And it's still worth doing for the impact that I want to do. And so then I was on my journey and it took two years to write about six to eight months to actually draft it. It takes about a year plus to edit it. The editing process was longer. And then it takes about uh, eight months to prepare all the final stuff, like doing the design, the layout, uploading everything everywhere, making sure distribution set up. And so now it's all coming together. And boy, to do a project that takes that much time that you've put so much energy into, it's exciting. And now it's been the catalyst to give me alignment to everything else that I do, because the book ends up being the thesis that I put my manifesto forward and everything branches from that. Mm -hmm. I think it's books are, are harder to write and publish, but they provide so much value and you create like a community of very strong and committed people because of the amount of value that you provide for them. And I don't know if you met him in person, Jim Quick, his book Limitless. Yeah. So yeah. very I've, cool uh, book. I, I, I was recommend. managing his account actually. <laughs> That's so cool because um, I read his book and of course the, the very first chapter was like actually to believe that this is uh, this advice is true and stuff and i recommended it. okay so the point i was saying here is that i have a lot of clients that work with uh, my company and stuff and they focus a lot on sh on short form content and i'm telling them yes that's great you get organic reach but you should have like a call to action at the end to get them to a longer piece of content so you can provide more depth and once they go to like, let's say like to your podcast, then if you have like a call to action at the end to buy your book, then you create a very strong and committed fan base. So now because people knew you as selling with love and you're going to create a book about it, I think it's going to bring massive value to your community. And I'm so excited to see like how it's going to perform and how it's going to impact your life because I'm kind of optimistic with that stuff. So, so I don't know. I. If for, so I'm excited. I don't know if you're out of time. It's up to you. One more question. Sure. I would love to hear your experience with Jim Quick because for the people that, for the people, actually for the people that know him, he's crazy. He's a very crazy guy. I loved his books so much. One of my favorite yeah. books. So I've had a chance to work with a Jim, fantastic individual, great, great on camera. Every time he did his recordings, he just has his knowledge so down. He was very good with structuring the quests. And so when he first came in and created Superbrain with Mind Valley, I wasn't too involved in that initial process. But then what we've started doing is in order to support his business as well, I was working in liaisoning with him so that students that would complete his brain training at Mind Valley, I could get them exposed 
to more offerings, more products from Jim. And so I was taking care of the success of authors. So I would talk with Jim and his team and we'd see like, what kind of campaigns can we create so that your students can get more of you in different things that they're trying to learn. So when it came to speed reading was a natural thing we wanted to bring to them. And so we orchestrated a campaign so that any graduate of Superbrain could go and learn from Jim on his platform around speed reading. And the campaign ended up being the, one of the most successful campaigns. We did a webinar together, you know, doing some Q and A's and everything and pointing people towards speed reading. It was fantastic. And so it was so successful that we then started the steps to actually bring those speed reading courses onto the Mind Valley platform as well. And uh, when it was a time to bring them on the stage, I had a chance to, you know, see the slots of where we wanted him to come speak. And he would always deliver an amazing presentation. And so, yeah, he's an incredible individual. His book came out. I know Mind Valley did some support with it. And yeah, it's great to see that he's been thriving and people are really, you know, using his methodology. And as for me personally, I remember names brilliantly. I'm able to use so many techniques that I've been able to increase my reading speed, my retention. I'm learning a new language right now, and I'm using concepts from Jim to, to learn uh, Indonesian in the process. And Indonesia is sedikit, so I can speak a little bit of Indonesian now. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> That's crazy. So you, so since you were close to him, you got you got kind of access to his coaching coaching um, sessions and that he was mentoring people. I guess you do, you did not only read his books. Yeah, no, I only read his books and went through his online courses and Ooh. saw him speak live. And after that, we'd be like, we hang out at like the, the parties at the Mind Valley events and such. So it was more about having cocktails with him than taking coaching with him. And <laughs> matter of fact, he's, he's, he's a really cool guy. So <laughs> that's crazy. Good for you. Good for you. So, yeah, we're out of time. Where can people contact you and uh, know more about your book and basically you? Yeah, it's, it's very easy uh, for anybody who's inspired, you know, if ever you you're someone who wants to grow a business, you want to make more impact, you want to learn to sell, but ne necessarily do it in a way that takes advantage of people. If you feel any kind of ickiness with sales and you wish there was a better way to do it, have a look at sellingwithlove.com. You'll be able to see uh, access to the book. You can subscribe to the podcast. There's tons of content there that can help anybody who is a solopreneur, entrepreneur, a creative a consultant, a coach, uh, small business owners, this is going to be the material that will make you unstoppable to really push forward whatever it is that you're trying to make better in the world, solving problems one sale at a time. So sellingwithlove.com, uh, you can find everything you need there. Great. Guys, see you in the next one. Peace.